Welcome to Coding After Work. It's that time again. It is. Where we code after work. And it's Thursday. It actually, is. Well, actually, we're Thursday not coding. Thursday is not in the name. No. I guess. That had nothing to do with anything. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how we roll here. Uh, and that's what we do. Oh, look at that. I'm sorry you're having a poopy day, but coding after work always make me feel a bit warm and fuzzy inside. Hopefully work. not the same feeling as when you... No, 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 don't. We, we just started. <laughs> we can't go less bad. <laughs> we can't. Not the deep dive <laughs> into bad, bad humor. What? <laughs> or what you call humor. Well, there you go. But we do have some sponsors. Oh, we do? We do. I believe we do. We have a Progress Telerik. We do. We do. Who has amazing Blazor UI. Bla no, I'm not saying it again. Yeah, you Blazor. are. Blazor. Blazor. It's I'm, a Blazor face. Blazor. <laughs> Blazor UI controls. Over 95 lost eye checks. Yes. And they're pretty And amazing. they do have a free trial. They do. Yeah. That's true. Who uh, else? We also have, have um, if insurance. And they have reached over a thousand people in their dev community. Oh, really? Yes. And they are constantly experimenting with new technologies and they work with everything from development, UX, uh, testing, DevOps, coding, what have you. And they actually have a bunch of open positions if you're interested. And I will link those as well in uh, the chat. Cool. Yeah. Also so sponsors. We haven't had a guest for quite some time now. Um, we're super happy to we uh, are. be able to bring one in. Yes. So let's... With awesome slides. Spoilers. Yep. Well, cliffhanger. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Hey, Jenny. Hi. Hey, Jessica. How are you? We're doing we're, great. Yeah. Yeah. I'm anticipating the, uh, the slide. <laughs> <laughs> very, very, very good today, like your like your T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the ones who know, they know. Uh, <laughs> I need a pen <laughs> because they, it's they broken. They go together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I, I just yesterday uh, was able to add dot tap files to my ZX Spectrum emulator. Oh, man, fantastic! Oh, I look forward to so, seeing that. And it's working. Excellent. I was so happy <laughs> when I got <laughs> home. Uh, when he, he uh, did that and I got home and he was playing uh, a song from Back to the Future, the musical, It oh, Works. Cool. It's <laughs> called It Works. So, yeah. It's true. Uh, love it. Love it. <laughs> oh, great cassette solution, Jessica. Yes, that's how I roll. Yeah. And look at that. Hey, it's Mr. Collins. Oh, hello, Tindall. Very hello. long ago I saw you, Steve. Like, Tuesday. <laughs> He, he comes to, uh, to our, our Milton Keynes meetup on chi on the Tuesday. It was on Tuesday. Oh, we yeah. ski there. So, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, yeah. He asks if you actually stole them. No, no he has uh, no, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, these were oh, there we go. Hard, hard graft. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Should we share them? Because we've spoken about them. I think it's time. I've hyped them. <laughs> you have. But I think they will hold on. <laughs> I think so too, especially if you're into retro. So, so with Jimmy's Spectrum emulator, I felt I did have to have some specky slides in it and the Spectrum <laughs> a bit later. So, so stay tuned. So, Look at that. How, what's not to love? Oh, I have no oh, idea. Wait, wait, you're, you're, let, let's, yeah. let, let's get the Spectrum loading. Oh, oh yes. look at that. And it does load like that. And yay for the specky font. <laughs> it is insane it's how like the they made I, I had to speed this up because otherwise we'd be here for about 20 minutes otherwise. <laughs> I, I, I was just about to say, isn't that going a little bit fast? <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that was sped, sped up about five times in Camtasia. <laughs> but but let, let, let's is... bring Smack Bang up today. Nice high resolution now. Nice. So, and, and I don't, I don't understand how people develop games for the platforms available, like the Spectrum, for instance. There's no memory to speak of. <laughs> no. There's no disc. There's no. Well, you need to have a lot of time. 
Debug okay. is something that takes yeah. four or five minutes to load. Yeah. <laughs> Start the debugger Even with micro drives. <laughs> yeah. No, no, that's not for me. <laughs> right. Okay. Let's oh, get we have a solution. It's tears and alcohol. <laughs> oh, there you have it. I, 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 <laughs> and I, was, I, was, I was too memory. young for that when I was writing for the Spectrum. <laughs> oh, chocolate <laughs> can also works. Chocolate usually Cheers, works yeah. as well. Yeah, <laughs> for, for me yeah. in Visual Studio, that's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. This could be a while. Let, let, let's go, shall we? Okay. So, as you've already gathered, I'm Steve Collins, but because that's such a common name around the globe, I go by the alias of Steve Talks Code. So, if you see Steve Talks Code, that's me. Um, I'm based in West Sussex in the UK, so right down on the south coast. I'm about 20 miles away from Brighton on the south coast. Um, I blog at stevetalkscode.co.uk and I tweet at stevetalkscode. Get a sort of theme going here. Um, as we've just alluded to, as uh, Thindall's pointed out, um, I run the Milton Keynes user group, which is a bit of a stretch given it's two and a half hours drive away. So that's the, that's the joy of lockdown. I, I can be that far away and I run it all virtually. So we're going to be sort of virtual, certainly through to the end of the year. We've got lots of great speakers. So um, there's the meetup link there. Please feel come along to join us. So I've got quite a few links in, in this talk today. So rather than having to sort of take screen grabs and write down bits of paper, there's a bit.ly link there and a QR code. So I'll go on to the next slide and leave that there for, for a sec. But the, the bit.ly link is at the top of the slides. I'm, hold on. Is it that way or that way? I'm just, I, no, it's over there. It's, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's so difficult. <laughs> I don't, I'm, yeah, I'm putting it in the right direction. Yay. Over, up, up at the top. There. So <laughs> today I'm going to talk about source code generation. But warning, if you come for a real deep, in-depth talk about how to code them all, wrong talk. Um, people like Stefan Poltz, um, I'm just trying to think, there's, there's a few, few others, it will come back to me in a minute, but there's lots of other people who do real in-depth talks. This is just a fun retro talk because I'm very old and I like to get geeky about retro computing. So this is a 30 year talk of source code generation, but we come smack bang up today with .NET 5, .NET 6 source code generators. Then we start to have a look into the future with AI. We're going back to the future. Nice. <laughs> so, what is source code generation? Well, it's probably better to start by saying what, for the purpose of this, isn't source code generation. So, we know we've got things like web forms and MVC, the server-side applications that will go and spit out HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Yes, that's kind of generating code, but it's not generating code that you're going to run. That's just rendering code that you're going to send down to a browser to pass and execute down there. So that's not part of this talk. Then we're into a bit of a gray area. Jimmy's favorite, Blazor and TypeScript. <laughs> These, yes, they're generating code, but it's more to do with sort of transpiling and sort of taking stuff from one language and converting it to run on another language. So sort of TypeScript's taking TypeScript and then converting it into JavaScript. So yes, it is code generation of a sort, but again, I'm not talking about that. Then lastly, JSON, JSON serializers and regular expression evaluators. These are generating code, but it generates it in memory and runs it at runtime. You never actually see the source code and you really wouldn't want to, and we'll talk about why later. <laughs> But again, that's not what I'm talking about. What I am talking about are Donit source code generators. So these are things that will actually create files for you. Now, admitted, you don't get them on the disk by default, but we'll talk about that in a bit. <laughs> but you actually get genuine C sharp code and you write them in C sharp. This is sort of the, the main thing that I want to get to. But how did we get here so get keeping with the 80s vibe and nicking rip, ripping off stranger things but i felt it had to be done i want to take you back in time to 1988 
And as we've alluded to, back in 1988, I was writing on one of, one of, one of those things, one of those things. The Sinclair ZX Spectrum, very close to my heart as it is, is for Jimmy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm smiling from ear, ear to ear. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. So to give this some context, why am I talking about the spectrum in the talk about source code generators? So long before we had GitHub and the various online things where you could go and look at other people's code. In fact, this was before we even had the World Wide Web. If you wanted to sort of share code with other people, other than sticking it on a cassette and stick it in the mail, if you wanted to share to a wide audience, you needed to get your program published in a magazine. Now, I've got a selection of ones in the U we had in the UK. Did, did you have a very wide selection in Sweden? Uh, we had those, oh. um, at least some of them. I, I, was, I, I was seven years old in 85 when I got my first computer. So I, I, I borrowed my brother's uh, uh, magazines. Yeah, so I've, I've had a bunch of those, but I, I was never old enough to buy them myself. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm a, we also have. I'm a tad older. I, I was I was a teenager. Um, I was what? Third, I think it was around my thirteenth birthday. I I got my my first Spectrum, but nice. that, that was a few years before before what we're talking about. But the thing is with the, these magazines, as I've sort of alluded to, the, that was a way of getting your program published. Now, here we have a typical example of a listing. Now, these were mostly written in Sinclair Basic, or if you were ahead of Commodore 64, it was sort of Commodore Basic, all the different basics. But this was a time when you got Basic in the ROM of your home computer, you booted it up, and you were straight into Basic. No, no DOS, no Windows, just just Basic. And you had to type load dash as quote, quote, just to load a program. So out, out from the get go, you had to know a tiny, teeny, tiny bit of programming just to load a game. Now, the problem with having programs written in basic is that they were slow, very slow. Now, the problem with the Sinclair basic was it was to save memory. They ran it as an interpreter rather than compiling it. Now, if, if you think that the Spectrum only had a, a I think it was a make, one megahertz or eight megahertz CP, CPU, uh, the, the Zilog Z80. And as we were talking about earlier, only 48K of RAM. In fact, my first Spectrum only had 16K of RAM. So it was really, <laughs> really tight on memory. So if you wanted performance, you had to get down to the bare bone, bare metal programming and write Z80 machine code. So we didn't have plural type, we didn't have YouTube videos to tell us how to do this. You have magazine features and books, and I still have <laughs> books here. Here they are. So they've been, in my... <laughs> they've been in my loft for, for God knows how long, about 20 years. But when I started writing this talk, I, I went, I've got to get them down. So what one did you have there, Jimmy? Because you're quite small on my screen, so I, I, can't, I can't, can't see which one you uh, have. Programming is Z80. That was the oh, book I, oh. I used for the emulator. So page Ex one, Ex instruction Excellent. one, implementing. Excellent stuff. So as I say, you, you had to get down to Z80 machine code. But to do that, you weren't programming pure bytes. Like you, you were writing in assembly language. And to turn that assembly language into the raw Z80 machine code, you needed an assembler. Now, here we've got a short snippet of a program, only 35 bytes long, but for 35 bytes, that's quite a verbose listing. Magazines weren't going to spend tens of pages printing out an assembly listing for someone to type in. Also, you had different assemblers with different formatting. That wasn't the way to go. So the bit that we were really interested in is these 35 bytes of machine code. So if we transpose those in, into some lines of hex, then we can turn them into a spectrum data program of data lines. So the way to do it was to have these hex dumps and you got the decimal checksum at the end to make sure that you typed in correctly. Now, it, that was the problem with typing in programs from magazines is, is that you could easily make mistakes and type in the page of hex in your, your eyes, because on a fuzzy cathode ray tube TV, <laughs> your eyes started to go and then you were looking this and then you felt a bit sick and then you, you left it and you couldn't say, and if you saved it, you'd then wait about five minutes to save it to cassette. Hence Jessica's t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> this is 
actually from Microsoft Build, I think. Oh. No, Ignite. Oh. Microsoft oh. Ignite. Yeah. <laughs> um, but how do we create these lines of data? And more importantly, what on earth has this got to do with the talk about source code generators? This is why 1988 was a landmark year for me, because I saw this program published in your Sinclair magazine, The Data Banker. And this program does exactly what I've just been describing. It would read through memory, and it would take that memory, convert it into hex, put the, and create the data lines with the checksums at the end. Now, this was the first time I'd seen a program that could actually write code itself, and that just sort of blew my mind. But what was really interesting was that the feature editor sort of said, here it is, quite short for what it does, but I'm quite surprised that Tom used basic instead of machine code. But there you are. Now, I've been learning machine code for about two, three years. And in my youthful naivety, that was the gauntlet throw down. I thought, I could write one of those. That's got to be <laughs> <interesting>. <laughs> Oh, dear. They say estimating is hard. And that, that, was, that was really naive of me. You may be thinking, but yeah, surely it's easy. You're just reading some memory. You're turning it into, into hex. You're just creating some strings and save it. Uh, that's not how the spectrum works. <laughs> no, 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 no. I think as simple as just having ASCII text. Um, that's because the spectrum was unusual in the way it handled basic commands. Um, instead of typing character by character, which you would these days in Visual Studio, or even back in the day on something like a VIC-20 or Commodore 64, no. The guys at Sinclair thought it would help people to learn pro how to program basic by printing all the commands on the keyboard, as you can see there, and then assigning all those keywords to a key. Now, there were more keywords than there were keys on the spectrum. Otherwise, it would have been a massive keyboard. So you've got all these weird and wonderful shift keys of sort of symbol shift, um, cap shift, press them together to get extended shift and so on. Oh, that was fun programming. And, and you were saying about having the patience to program on, on one of those back in the day, Jessica. Yeah, that, that, that's <laughs> my, my replacement key, keyboards. It was almost like a, a modern day keyboard. and. Um, that was the only way I could handle it. But if we turn on our 1980s TV, boot our spectrum up and start typing. Now, I think I'm right in saying that the later sort of 128K spectrums, you could actually type it character by character. But back in the day on the old 48K one, you were stuck by having to go through all these weird Ks and Es and Cs, all these different modes on the spectrum. Now on the spectrum, there are 90 odd keywords to the basic language, which feels quite small compared to modern day languages. Um, and as each keyword was assigned to a key combination, they were stored as tokens in memory rather than plain ASCII, as I was just saying. That meant what my program had to do, I couldn't just go and say, spit out some ASCII and then save it to tape, because if you tried to load it back in, the spectrum would just go, I have not a clue what this is about which meant that what my program had to do was actually emulate me typing all those data statements in the keyboard like I was just showing on the screen. That was an interesting challenge. Luckily, I had Spectrum ROM disassembly, which, to give it a modern day analogy, would be looking like looking at the Roslyn GitHub repo. That told you exactly how everything on the Spectrum worked. Have you, have you had a look at it, Jimmy, as part of your um, Blazor emulator? Uh, not that one. So, so I, I've got things etched in my memory, like 0556 is the routine to load, load, load programs into memory, and you could copy it, and then that's when you got the really fast loaders going. 30-odd mm. years later, though, these addresses are still etched in my memory for some bizarre <laughs> reason. Of course they are. Yeah. <laughs> 04C2, the save routine. Um, <laughs> so as I say, I had to emu emulate, type, type in all these in. But after four months, and it was four months of, I wouldn't say swearing because I was too young to swear, obviously. I triggered a recursion of writing a program that could read, read some data, create a program that someone else, that I could print out, that someone else could then type in to then, get, then go and read their program and print it out and send it on to someone else. That's very recursive. All I can say is, thank God we now share code via GitHub. <laughs> so if I just scroll down, Uh, that's my, my program itself, or, or dog fooded. If I zoom it, zoom in, zoom out, zoom out, you can see that at the top there's the hex loader, and then below is the program itself, 
that we run, load it into memory, and then you could save it out as machine code and then run it to read your own program. Very meta. So I wrote this nice covering letter and a cassette tape went in the mail. <laughs> and I, the, the, <laughs> these ones here, I had up in my loft. I, they've been, I've saved them for 30 years because back in the day to protect your copyrights, what you did was you put it all in an envelope and sent it recorded delivery to yourself to prove your own copyrights. And I thought after 30 years, no one's going to rip me off now, so I can I might as well open it. But very nice, polite letter saying, Dear David, please publish my program. I think it's quite good. A few months later, July 1989, it was published in your Sinclair. Woohoo! Fame at last. <laughs> <laughs> now, if I zoom in, first off, he's got he added an N to my name for some unknown reason. I'm not Stephen with a V, I'm Stephen with a PH, and I'm, only my parents called me Stephen, <laughs> and that was when I was in trouble. But Steve Collins, Steve has just written the single most revolutionary and visually astounding routine in computer programming history. Now, I knew it was good, but I didn't think it was that good. But it's good to go on the CV, isn't it? I think I think he was I think it was his last list editorial and he was getting a bit carried away and demob happy. Perhaps he took a few beers that day. But anyway, before I move on, let's consider what what we learned by doing a source code generator on the spectrum other than, like Jimmy, I'm very geeky about retro computing. So to generate source code, you need to start with some source input. Now on the spectrum, that was reading the memory. Next, you need to understand the syntax of the language that you're generating to. So in that case, it was Sinclair Basic. Lastly, you need to understand how to get the code you've generated to actually run. Now that's having to do arcane things like pretend you're typing it into an interpreter on the spectrum, or now in .NET, how to get it into Roslyn. So skipping forward a few years to 94, and I started using VB3, which felt light years away from Sinclair Basic and machine code. This was the first time I had an IDE, a proper IDE, not just ty typing basic into, into a computer, that would actually write some code for me based on clicking a few things around in the developer tool. We're into the world of mouse-driven development, yay! <laughs> now in VB3, the code generation was fairly primitive. All it was doing was creating stubs of event handlers for the user interface controls but this was still way ahead of what I'd been doing on the spectrum. So for about eight years, I was I used the various versions of VB, starting with 16-bit Windows applications in VB3, desktop applications, then 32-bit ones in VB4 and 5. But by the time we got to VB6, we were writing enterprise applications that you worked on intranets and this new fangled weird thing called the internet was using classic ASP. Now, when I say enterprise, what do I mean? reading and writing to a database. That, that's what enterprise was back, in, back at that time. And this was when three-tier architectures were all the rage. And it was decreed by the Holy Temple of DBAs on high that thou shalt only access the database by using stored procedures. How dare you write a select statement directly against this, the database? So given how boring it is to write CRUD boilerplate, we started looking around for tools that could read database schemas and create not only the stored procedures for us, but also the VB6 code that would go and call them. So I did a bit of hunting around, and this was a typical example of sort of something that was around at the time, where you could point, point to a database schema, and it would knock out the stored procedures, and then the VB code. But time marches on, and in 2002, we were introduced to the wonderful new world of .NET. Now, at the time of the launch of .NET, Microsoft's big pitch was that the internet was the big thing, and they're playing catch up, but yeah, they're right. It is. It was the big thing, and created dot their platform as, so that developers could be productive in using these new web technologies. Hence, dot net as the name, because you know it's all about the net. <laughs> <laughs> Later, we're still stuck with it. I think. Think there's been a bit of, on the twentieth birthday. I think there were a few um, conversations about why are we still calling it dot net. But there you go. So. At this time, this sent Microsoft into overdrive talking about XML web services using SOAP. Did you did you both start start with SOAP or were you a bit later? Uh, oh, I, I used SOAP. Yeah. Still do in some cases. <laughs> oh, 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 I feel oh, you. He doesn't mean in the shower. <laughs> Ooh, nice. You're doing the pun. I know, I'm sorry. I don't know what came over me. 
Uh, I mean, it is a restroom after all. Yep. Oh, yeah. oh dear, oh dear. Oh, we have more of them. <laughs> Don't you worry. Um, so when .NET 1, 1 came out, uh, we were writing web services using ASMX files. Later on, when we got to .NET 3, 5, we started doing WCF. Um, so we, we could also consume services from other people that could be written in Java. <laughs> Yeah, we're .NET people, we don't talk about Java. Um, it didn't matter. It got applications to talk to one another over HTTP, which was way better than the horrors of like, things like DCOM and Corba, all these real proprietary, oh, oh that I've, it sends a ship down my back thinking about having to write that stuff all over again. But moving swiftly on, much like working with store procedures for database access, you need a lot of boilerplate code to work with web services because you need to do all the stuff about creating the connection, what happens if the connection fails, understanding how what method to call, how you create your XML to send. It, it, it was a ton of code. And luckily, we got a wizard in Visual Studio when it first came out to generate that code for us. And then when WCF came along, we got a command line tool as well. So with the wizard, you pointed at a WSDL definition, which for, for those who haven't had the joys of working with SOAP, it's a bit like a Swagger file that we get in modern H, um, HTTP JSON. I, I never want to say REST because it always feels impure to say REST about it. <laughs> it's not truly RESTful, but, but yeah. I'll go with the flow. Pointing at your REST service, you get, get a Swagger file. WSDL was a similar thing back in the day for, for SOAP. So in the wizard, you make a few choices about what to generate, what language you were targeting, C sharp, VB, what your namespace is. And after a while, you got some code. Now, the problem with the code generated was that if you edited the file and needed to run the wizard again, it was bye bye to your changes. Because even though that warning was there saying this will be lost, lots of people, myself included, <laughs> made changes to that file and then cried when we had to regenerate it and all your changes had been lost. And this was back in the day when we were still using source safe and source control. So trying to go back was painful, to say the least. The other problem with it, with the code was because it was effectively immutable. And you, you, if you went tried to make those changes, you, they'd be lost. What you needed was you see some event hooks. Now, in the original version, these were events that you'd wire up event handlers to. Um, to do your customization, but that changed a bit later, and I'll come on to that in a minute. Lastly, as the tools were closed source, because Microsoft hadn't jumped on the open source bandwagon at this stage, you had no control over the quality of the code that was generated, and you might get warnings from things like StarCop or FXCop saying, no, oh, this doesn't conform to the coding standards, even though it was Microsoft that had written it. But if you look at VS 2022 now, you now get some more service options. And I'll talk about those later. But what we do see is we start to see the introduction of this generated code attribute. And what that does is it tells the compiler and analyzers like the Roslyn analyzers or ReSharper if you're using that, that this is auto-generated code so you can ignore checking it for sort of coding standards. And also if you're doing code coverage tools, it'll, it, you can set it to say, I'm not interested in covering this code because I didn't actually write it. So if we go back to our three rules of source code generation that I started with a bit earlier, we need to add three more boxes to, to our things to consider when generating code. The code we generate needs to be high quality and decorated as being auto-generated so we don't get analyzers moaning at us. When created, it's effectively immutable. So if we generate it again, any changes that we make to the files that get generated will get lost. Because of that, we need to provide some points where we'll call out to developers' own code for customization. Now, we've already addressed the first of those about the um, generated code at attribute, but the last two have had an influence on the C -sharp language itself, and that is simply to support source code generation. So in C -sharp 2, we got the partial keyword that was introduced so that a class could be split into multiple files. Now, the primary thing was, it was back in the day of uh, this was win forms and web forms where you had the designer file and you had your custom code file as well. 
this split meant that the code generator didn't need to worry about identifying which bits of the file were generated and which bits had been manually created because I think in it was either WinForms or WebForms, the first one, it sort of had regions and it sort of said, don't change this region, but you can edit this region. But it's still a problem. Us developers, we never re read notes. And some developers would still make changes to the generated code and get very cross when the, their code got wiped out. It didn't help that the warning was inside of a collapsed region. So if you've never expanded that region, do people still use regions? I, I haven't used regions for a long, long time. People still use them. Not sure if that's okay, though. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps they shouldn't, but they do. Yeah. Is that the first facepalm ever? <laughs> I think it might be. Yeah, it could well be. <laughs> so because of that, in, when we get to C Sharp 3, we got partial method declarations added. Now, it's interesting. I was, do, do, you, do you listen to the Merge Conflict um, podcast with James Montemagno and Frank Kruger? Because they were talking yeah. about partial methods, um, I think it was last week about what's the point of partial methods. The point of partial methods was it allowed authors of code generators to provide stuff. So I said in the earlier one that there were events that you could wire up handlers to. Well, event handlers are very leaky from a memory point of view if you forget to unwire the handler when, when you want to dispose of stuff. So by having partial methods, it allowed you to sort of implement the gang of four strategy pattern where it sort of says, I've got this method and if it's been written, I'll go and call it. Now, with those methods, if someone doesn't provide an implementation, it would be a no operation thing when the compiler comes along. Now, because there's the risk of a no operation, you don't want to be able to have people have a dependency on that method. So some rules were put in place. Firstly, you couldn't have a return value. So they had to be void and they had to have no out parameters. Secondly, because you didn't want to create that dependency, they were private. So the only thing that could see them was the, the co generated code or your code inside the partial, the other partial, somewhere else in the partial class that you'd written. But when we get to C sharp nine and 10, these restrictions were taken away. Now, part of the reason for that was we've gone from the old C++ written compiler that was the original C, C sharp uh, compiler to Roslyn and Roslyn's a lot more smarter and can do a lot more things but also it was brought in to support source code generators in .NET 5 so those restrictions have been taken away but if you don't provide an implementation and you've created it as a, as a method with a return value Roslyn will start moaning at you with a compiler error so I think it swings in roundabouts but I think if it's still a void method with no outputs I think it will still no op it So I've covered SOAP services, but now we have two modern standards as well. We've got Open API, so what was called Swagger for HTTP JSON services or or REST, depending on how pure you want to be about the term REST. And GRPC. Oh, we got a suggestion to call it REST-ish. REST-ish. <laughs> yeah. And we've also got GRPC, which is the new kid on the block. There's a bit like a binary equivalent to it. I'm, I know several people who do really good talks on G GRPC, but um, I'm not going to go into much detail on this. But the difference being that whereas on H on REST-ish services, you get the <laughs> swagger file, um, for GRPC, you've got proto definitions, which are, again, it, it's metadata about what the service exposes and what the messages in and out are. So for res REST clients, the wizard adds an open API reference to your project file. Um, and that adds some calls to N NSWAG. Has anyone used NSWAG before? Yeah. Yeah. So under under I the bonnet, Microsoft have, have set, sitting on top of NSWAG underneath. Though there's a, a team um, at my, Microsoft, um, BB's the PM for it. And there's a new thing coming out with .NET 7, which is a new any language. Um, thing that will generate clients for um, open API services. Um, but what's interesting about the open API reference is where it's, whereas NSWAG was sort of, you, you had to jump through a few hoops to sort of wire it into MS Build so it would generate every time you build. Now it's completely out of the box and it hooks into the Roslyn compiler chain as well. 
Now, the only problem with the open API reference thing is you've got the wizard and that, that's great. But NSWAC has got a whole raft of commands um, that are documented well in NSWAG, but they're not documented very well in terms of open API reference. So when I first started playing with it, I was getting really frustrated. So in the true tradition of bloggers, I wrote a blog about it to remind myself later how, how to do it. So there's a link to it at the bottom there. For gRPC, as well as generating clients so, so that our things can go and talk to gRPC services, it can also stub out a server for you. Or if you're just interested in having a class library of the messages going to and fro, you can just generate a, a class library of those as well. Right, I need a quick sip. Are there any questions in chat? Mostly uh, talk about the uh, new naming for it. <laughs> we have the restish, <laughs> and then then Jimmy had a suggestion of, of uh, rest more or less, so rest less. <laughs> so it became a... Uh... Well, we do have one. Can I generate a protofile from a class? Oh, the other way around. Interesting. You, you, so with, with the built-in tools, you generate a, generate classes from the proto files, but I'm sure is it? I think it is it. Mark Gravel has a has a tool that can reverse engineer classes into a proto file. I'd, I'd have to go and look that up, but that that kind of rings bells that Mark Gravel did did something as part of his gRPC suite. Cool. Any other questions? Not regarding to this, I believe. Why am I not getting power on my computer? Which is a completely different... Uh, charging. Yeah, but it just went down in, in super saving mode. Well, okay. <laughs> so, I may or may not be thrown out of chat room. So, there you go. Okay. Well, I'll, do, so I'll carry, carry on and then we'll catch up in a minute. Yeah. That, question's come. that sounds so. good. So we, we, we've talked about sort of dealing with REST, REST clients and SOAP clients and gRPC clients. What about sort of out, out the box sort of Visual, Visual Studio for RC Sharp code? So in VS 2005, we got some tooling to help with the horrible XML files used for configuration. When .NET came along, Microsoft loved XML, XML everything, app settings, ResX files, everything was XML. Thank heavens we've now got JSON and well, and YARP, um, not YARP, um, YAML. Is it debatable whether YAML, JSON are better than SOAP? Certainly JSON is. YAML, the, there is absolutely nothing worse than YAML. <laughs> well, according to you. Other than XML. According to you. I prefer XML, <laughs> I got to say. I got to take that stand. Uh, and it's a hill you'll die on. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but for, for those, who, and, and it's st still there in, in, in .NET Framework world. We've got app.config app on web.config and these massive, great big XML files. And then these um, key value pairs of application settings and user settings. And before 2005, having to use the configuration manager and the resource manager to navigate those XML files was horrendous. So what Microsoft did with VS 2005, they, they gave us some designer tools that could go and create these settings.settings .settings file and the property resources files. What these were doing was they gave us a visual tool where you could go and set up your application settings as key value pairs there on the left and say whether they're application or user level, you could give them a default value. And what that would do was that would go and add that to your app, app config or web config as appropriate. And it would also go and create this static class called settings or, or, the, re, or the resources under properties. And that's great, but if, if you're a fan of clean code, it's not very solid. <laughs> it, it, it's static and it, it, it's glitchy and it's a bit horrible, but it was better than having to navigate the XML yourself. So you, you, you make, it takes your choices on that. Now that was based on custom code generation tools. Now you could go and write your own one of those, but that picture there, that was kind of my reaction when I looked into it. 
because <laughs> Visual Studio, and even now with 64-bit VS2022, was still an awful lot based on COM that was carried forward from VB Editor and the C++ editors. So I'm going to skip over that because it was just so horrendous you didn't want to touch it with a barge pole. But we talked earlier about the things generating CRUD store procedures and VB6 code for you. Out and outside, we still had te templated source code generation tools with .NET came along. So my favorite at the time was this one called My Generation. Now, you, you could, again, point it at SQL Server, get a, get a database schema in, and you could write templates. Now, you were using VB script inside here. To add, but you've got a nice little IDE and, and sort of some early IntelliSense for you. So you can start to sort of script script out your, your store procedures and the VB code that will go and call, call them. But unfortunately, these fell out of fashion because of ORMs like n 8 and later Entity Framework. So I, I think the last version of my generation was about 2014, something like that, because that's when these ORMs were really starting to take hold. But over in Visual Studio world, when we get to VS 2015, we get the introduction of tech, tech oh, I always struggle with this, T4 templates, because I'm not going to try and say that full name. <laughs> I haven't got the teeth for it. Um, these were introduced with VS 2015, and you could have some text template files, and you could write, put some code inside these text template files. And a bit like we just saw with that My Generation one, it, it took the meta, metadata of pointing at a file. Now you could have your your own sort of files, and from that metadata in the file, go and generate some C-sharp or VB code. Now, there are a few limitations to T4 templates. The first being, this is very much a Visual Studio thing. It's not a compiler thing, it's a Visual Studio design at all. Early on, it was limited to Visual Studio, but I think later versions of Rider now support it. Um, but the main limitation to it is that because it it's inside Visual Studio. Visual Studio was written based on .NET Framework. The code you write inside is still limited to version to sort of using .NET Framework if you're trying to use anything from, from the CLR. Um, it doesn't support .NET Core, doesn't support .NET 6. That said, in VS 20, it was late 2019 version and certainly in 2022, whilst the code you write inside is pin to framework, you can now use them to generate code that you consume inside a .NET Core, or .NET 5, .NET 6 projects as well. Now, whilst I said I wasn't going to focus on these, I think it's worth having a mention of some of the techniques that we've all been using over the last few years. Reflection. Going back to when .NET first came out, these were we were first introduced to reflection. Now, back, back in sort of VB days, we didn't have reflection, and I was crying out for something where I wanted to go, I want to go and look at this this object and I don't know how to do it, but we got that in .NET, .NET when that came out. So it gave us a way to inspect methods and properties on, on a type and even call methods at runtime. And how many people who sort of violated private methods by using reflection to, to go and inspect a class and then create a call to go and call a private method only for it to break later when someone went and chose the private method that wasn't for public. Yeah. Jimmy's got his hand up. Yeah, I've done that. Yeah, I was going to say you laughed a little bit too genuine for that one. Oh, I have used reflection. <laughs> that, that is one of the thing, one of the technologies that I, every time I'm talking about reflection, I'm like, and, well, we can use, and the word, I cannot for the life of me remember the name of it. Every time. <laughs> I have no other technologies like that, but reflection, I never remember the name. Yeah. There you go. So most people are familiar with using reflection to go and sort of look at a, a type and look at its properties, its methods, um, even go and execute a method, even though we shouldn't and get a slapped wrist for doing it. What's less well known about is you've got reflection emit. And what this can actually do is generate code and execute it at runtime. Now, this is partly why when Xamarin came along, refle reflection didn't work on things like iOS devices because Apple said, uh-uh, you, you're not generating code, code on the fly at runtime. But this is qu quite heavily used in some parts of the .NET framework. But 
if you want to write it yourself, as you can see from that, that screen, it's writing opcodes of MSIL. So the, the stuff that our C-sharp, our VB, our, our F-sharp all gets boiled down to. So it can be j taken down to the JIT, uh, the, the JIT um, to then turn it into code that's going to run on, on your, your PC or whatever device these days, not just a PC. But those opcodes, that looks surprisingly like writing machine code to me. And I don't want to be writing machine code. That, that just looks absolutely horrendous. Um, and me and pretty much the whole world went, ew, not doing that. So that didn't really take off as a way of generating code. Also, it doesn't complete cover the complete .NET framework. And because you can effectively generate code and execute it at runtime, that means you could do some pretty nasty things with it. So there's a whole load of security issues. And I'll be touching on security in a little bit. Ah, I had a problem, so I used regular expression. Then I had two problems. Most people are familiar with the regex class for matching strings against sort of regular expressions. But under the hood, regex is actually using what we just saw. It goes and creates a class through reflection emit that does all the logic for Mac doing that, taking that string Mac pattern and converting it into, into actual code that will go and do the matching. The problem is that by default, if you say I've got a new regular expression, it goes and use up one of these classes and it's constantly doing that all the time. So the performance isn't that great. So to get around that, there are a couple of options to help you with this that either cache, it, cache the sort of uh, classes that it's generated at startup, or you can even get that compiled MSIO down to an assembly file. I'm, I've got some news about regex coming up, coming up but regex, per, personally, I prefer the static regex. So it's not doing, there's this whole, you could do a whole talk on regex, but you probably wouldn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I will move swiftly on to something else. Aspect orientated programming. So outside the world of Microsoft, other code generation development was going on out in the world of AOP. Now these take another approach to code generation. We've just seen the MSIL of reflection emit. These do a thing called IL weaving where it generates MSIL. And then as part of the comp compilation process, it can spot for things like an attribute saying, I want to do some logging here, or it will spot code like um, I notify property change in WPF, for example. And there's a whole load of boilerplate where you have to sort of say, have I got an event to raise and so on, so on, so on, so on, all boilerplate. And we, well, programmers, we don't like writing unnecessary code. So this is why source code generation is so fabulous. Fewer keystrokes. Um, so it's a complicated process. I'm not an expert in it, but what it does do is unlike virtually any other source code generator, is it can rewrite your code because it's right it's right down in the guts of MSIL before as it's being compiled. So the two two main projects that people are most probably familiar with is Fodi, that's the open source. Now they're now starting to ask for financial contributions, which I think is fair enough, as a lot of open source projects are these days, because maintaining open source is a massive job. Um, so if you're using Fodi, don't begrudge paying for it. If, if you're in the commercial world, there's PostSharp, and that's been around for many years. Um, I saw a talk from Gail from PostSharp, and they've now got a new version of PostSharp called Mesalama. And whereas the PostSharp was right down and sort of did its own compilation process, now they've taken a fork of the Roslyn compiler, and now it's they sort of inject their own Roslyn compiler instead of using the Microsoft out-the-box one. And that then does its all injection using sort of source code generation. Expression trees. Do you two understand expression trees? Because I've I really struggle with expression trees. Uh, I have used them, but um, it, it's a little bit tricky. Hmm. Uh, this is Wouldn't what do a talk on it. <laughs> Definitely not. Definitely <laughs> this is why I'm going to skip over this slide because a lot of it goes <laughs> right over my head, but. I've included it because it, it is a kind of source code generation. What it does is it, when you do, it underpins things like link and the dynamic language runtime. And what it allow, it does is it takes things like Lambda expressions and converts them into trees. 
And from those trees, you can then convert to other languages. So the one that most people are, you know, are going to be familiar with is Entity Framework, where it'll take your query queries from Link and then turn them into SQL. That is using expression trees under the bonnet. Talking of Entity Framework, Entity Framework is a complete rag bag of just about everything we've talked about so far. So we've got inspection of SQL metadata, so it can read a database schema and go and cre create classes for you, so database first design. Conversely, you can, it can take your C Sharp classes and generate a database schema. You've got expression trees underneath that will take your link queries and turn them into SQL statements. And then at the end, you've got reflection to bind the stuff coming back from your database back into your .NET objects. But I just want to generate some code. I've just spent, what, what is it, um, about 40 minutes talking about all these all these weird and wonderful ways we've done so, and everything you rub up against a brick wall of a problem. Either they're too complex to understand, they, they do stuff like writing IL, they, they're just plain complex to use. Um, some are external tools outside Visual Studio, some are running only inside Visual Studio. Um, some are limited to .NET Framework, some are only have a subset of support for .NET Core and .NET 6. And some are closed source, so if you don't like them, tough. There's not a lot you can make do about it. And at that point, it's time for me to have a sip. Are, are there any questions now? Uh, we do have a, uh, a message, a picture that I'm a going picture. to show now. Yay! <laughs> this is from Tyndall. <laughs> oh, Eric. Eric, yes. Yep, Eric. We've talked before about our love of the spectrum. <laughs> <coughs> right. Yeah, he's, he's um, I've just I've got my voice back. So we get to November 2020 and C Sharp 9 and .NET 5, a new hope, and the introduction of .NET source code generators. Now I know that .NET 5 has just gone out of support, but this is a massive landmark in source code generation. So with the release of .NET 5 and C Sharp 9, we were introduced to source code generators on C Sharp. Now, technically, some people call them .NET source code generators. Some people call them C Sharp source code generators. Really, this is a bit of a misnomer because really, it's all about Roslyn. Roslyn has made this fe feature available. It just so happens that it got released with .NET 5 and changes were made to the C Sharp 9 to allow it to be used in, in sort of anger. So how do these differ from what I've talked about so far? First and foremost, you write them in C sharp. You don't have to go and write templates. You don't have to go and emit MSIL and learn IL language. You just write them in C sharp and you generate C sharp, not MSIL, not, none of that nonsense. Secondly, they're not tied to Visual Studio. This is wholly about Roslyn. Visual Studio has some tooling for it, but you can use Visual Studio, VS Code, um, Rider. Just use the, the dot, .NET build command. It's all about the, the compiler. But as I said, with AOP, AOP and IL weavers, whilst IL weavers can rewrite code, source code generators can only add brand new code, or if you've written partial classes, go and extend your class by adding a code generated partial class and add some partial methods to it as well. Now, these new source code generators can be as simple or complex as your requirements demand. Ultimately, the goal of the generator is to build C sharp code. You do that by building up a, str a string of C sharp code that then you hand off to Roslyn to go and get compiled. So, whilst you could use the template engine, that might well slow things down. So, you'll, you're effectively having to write um, interpolated strings, and that gets really quite messy, especially if you've got quote marks and curly braces. Now, I think it's in C sharp 11 coming up. We've now got these new new ways of having strings where you've got multiple back tick marks where you can yeah. say, um, I'm, I'm going to have back ticks and everything inside here. If I've got quote marks and curly braces and everything, that's verbatim. So that I'm looking raw forward to string, uh, raw, raw, yeah, raw, yeah, raw strings that, that I'm so looking forward to that because, because when writing, um, both source code generators and the unit test for source code generators, it gets really hairy having to sort of es escape all your quotes and curly braces and backslashes. Um, but uh, but but that I'm 
I, I digress. Um, what I really like about these is that there's nothing about having to write an installer to install them into Visual Studio like you would with the uh, the uh, templating things previously. This, you can just go go and write it, have a project within your solution. If you want to share it with people, you can go write a new get package if you want, either for your internal team or publish it to the world. But more of that in a little bit. Beware, there's dragons ahead. Um, but what I tend to do is because, because the ones I tend to write are very solution specific, I just embed them in the, the same solution and have a cross reference from a project to say, I want to use this source code generator. So there's a handful of libraries needed to write a source code generator that I've shown here. The main thing to note is that when you write a source code generator, even though they're only supported in .NET 5, .NET 6, you have to write them as a sta .NET standard 2 library. Reason for that is because they're, as well as running inside Roslyn, they, they're sort of run by Visual Studio and things like um, Rider as well. But the main driver for this is Visual Studio, is that you have, have to write it in .NET standard because, and it has to be version two, because even with .NET uh, standard 2.1, Visual Studio starts to sort of get a bit upset with it and it, and it, you just, you've just got, you just can't handle it. So you have to write it in .NET standard. I've highlighted um, a thing there about is Roslyn component. Since VS uh, 1610, which was one of the later versions of uh, VS 2019, um, when it when these first came out, they were an absolute nightmare to try and debug. But the, having that in your VS, uh, your CS proj file makes it a bit easier to debug them, and there's now tooling for it built into Visual Studio. Um, same goes for if you're writing Roslyn analyzers. Have, have either of you? Done anything with Roslyn analyzers before? Actually, right now, no. No. no, yeah, I haven't either. And <laughs> I, 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 I think I, I think they're so powerful, and then I think so complicated. But that's another story. Oh, sorry. Actually, no, I'll cover it on this slide. So, if you're going to go and write a generator, the main things you need to know is you need to put this generator attribute on your class. And in .NET 5, you had to implement iSource Generator. Now, there's a change in .NET 6 that I'll come on to a minute, but I want to talk about source generators to give a feel of what's involved. So the iSource Generator interface has two inter methods, initialize and execute. So I, I won't go into a lot of de detail on here because it gets co quite co complicated and I haven't got some code to back it up. But in essence, the initialize method is where you first register your source code generator with the Roslyn compiler. And you have a syntax receive. If you're going to be writing source code generation based on C sharp code coming into your generator, you have a syntax receiver. And that's where the thing that goes and starts receiving the code that's coming in from Roslyn. Now, this is where source code div generators differ from previous things in Visual Studio. The generator can be triggered whenever there's a change to the consuming project. So as soon as you start typing away, in Visual on one of your files, if it's a file that your source generator is interested in, it, it'll pick up those changes pretty much straight away. Whereas things like T4 templates and what have you, you had to sort of manually trigger it unless you did some skullduggery inside MS Build. Um, if you're not listening for syntax changes, so for example, say you're listening for um, a J JSON file, there's not really a lot to do inside the initialize method. Now, in iSource generator, the, the real sort of guts of what's going on is inside the execute method. This is where the action happens. Now, you may be interrogating c -sharp code, or you may be looking at additional files, things like JSON files, text files, CSV files. Quite a common thing you might you might see is um, using JSON or CSV files to go and generate enums. So your business give you a, a JSON or CSV file of some values, the domain values, and you want to have an enum. You can write a source code generator. So every time that those change, you just drop the file in and you'll get your generated enum and anything that and you could take it further about all your switch statements or based on your enum and so on like that. Hugely powerful. The main thing is inside this execute method, this is where, where you need to build up a string of C-sharp code. And this is what I was saying about having the, um, the raw strings is going to come in really useful because it quite gets quite, quite glitchy sort of having to write all these sort of escape strings all over the place. If you're really clever, and I'm not, you can actually use the C, C sharp source code jet um, 
class language classes to go and actually build up a tree of c-sharp and then get it to spit out the c-sharp out but that that's way over my head like analyzer <laughs> um but ultimately you, you've got to you get past um, a parameter, which is a context, and you call the add source. And that's whether you give it a virtual file name and the source code that you want to include in, that you've been generated. So there's this picture on Microsoft Docs, and I've just added a little bit of an animation to it. But it basically sort of says, Roslyn, so Visual Studio or .NET Build will trigger a build in Roslyn. It'll, the source generator will step into the compilation. It'll analyze the source code, generate new source code, then it will hand that back into Roslyn and compilation resumes. Now, something to bear in mind with source code generators in the, is that you can't chain them. They're really each independent of one another because you've got no control of when Roslyn will be calling the different source code generators. So you can't generate one file and then have another source code generator triggered by that the one you, you've generated. It doesn't quite work like that. So if you need multiple source, source source files, you're going to have to generate them all inside one source code generator. But this is where it comes back full circle 30 odd years. Right back to when I was writing on Spectrum, it's all about syntax. Understanding the language of the syntax, sorry, the syntax of the language that you're generating for, just as I had to with Sinclair Basic on the Spectrum. However, in the case of source code generators, the input is also source code that someone else has written, C sharp code or could be VB code. Um, so to work with this, you need to understand how to navigate some C sharp code that will be the input to your generator, as well as the syntax of what's coming out. So I'm not going to go into a lot of depth with syntax trees. I'll have another quick sip of water so I don't lose my voice. Syntax trees. If you've ever looked at writing syntax, um, Roslyn analyzers, you may already be familiar with these, but I'll go through at a high level of what's going on just with my microphone a little bit. When you write your C-sharp code, every character contributes to either become one of three categories in the syntax tree. Starting with the simplest on the left, we've got trivia, which is mainly stuff that we're not interested in. So that's white space, comments, preprocessor, directive, stuff like that. From a source code generation point of view, we tend not to be interested. Tokens are the lowest level of syntax and can't be broken down any further. So these are our keywords, names of variables, text literals, punctuation marks, such as end of statements, semicolons, something like that. Not a million miles away from when I was looking up the keywords in the syntax tables on the Spectrum ROM. Plug for my old book again. <laughs> <laughs> um, because it's all about understanding tokens. These all that get bundled up into syntax nodes, which are groups. So we start bundling them up into groups of tokens that form declarations, statements, clauses, and expressions. So these nodes are effectively your program split out into the tree that can be queried with code. Now, there's a great website called SharpLab.io. Have either of you used SharpLab before? No. No. So, so Sharp, SharpLab is re really cool, especially if you want to play around with new features um, in the latest versions of C, C Sharp, because you get all the beta versions as, as well on there. Um, and you can sort of say, I want to use the very latest C Sharp. Now, it's great for doing things like decompiling into IL, but what it's also good at is showing you a syntax tree from some code. So I've only highlighted the namespace declaration because that's as pretty much as simple as it gets. So you've got the namespace declaration on the left, and we can start to see the tree breakdown on the right. So first, we've got the namespace keyword. Um, that is made up of the namespace keyword itself and some rounding white space. And we've got the identifier token, so the name that we're given our namespace, um, and that's surrounded by some trivia as well. If you've got full-on Visual Studio 2019 or 2022 um, on Windows, you can get a directory graph of the syntax tree as, as well if you prefer, but I, I tend to prefer looking at the, the Sharp Lab version as well. But if you want to do that, you do have to install some extra bits and bobs into Visual Studio. So you've got the modeling SDK and the DGML editor as well. Um, so I sort of flip, flip between the two, but I tend to mainly use Sharp Lab IO for sort of examining the, the syntax tree. So far, we've concentrated on syntax analysis, but that's not the whole story. While syntax tree tells you about the code that's been sort of typed in, so you can spot things like attributes and, and um, looking for keywords, for example, the semantic tree gives that code some meaning. So 
syntax tree is just being handed a load of, load of text and then sort of being able to navigate around that text in blocks of keywords and what have you. Semantic tree, if you've used to using reflection and looking for methods and properties or type, it's a similar kind of thing. Navigating the semantic tree is inspecting the, the real meaning of that code rather than just what's been typed in. So that's where you might have things like when, I think in C-sharp you've got this thing like lowering where at IO level it will sort of take what you've typed in and lower it down to something a bit more si simpler behind the scenes. So this tells you what exactly is about to get compiled into MSIL. This is what makes SOX generators a good replacement for anywhere you've got reflection code because anywhere that you've been net looking at code in reflection at runtime and looking for methods and properties and expecting that stuff, that's all happening at runtime. This is happening at compile time. So all that stuff, all that runtime sort of performance hit that you've been taking, that, that just disappears if you do it at compile time with the source generator. As I've alluded to, you can, as well as looking C-sharp code, you can take other text files, now JSON, CSV. You could even sort of write your own language, like Dylan Beatty's Rockstar, and have a, have a Rockstar <laughs> path written as a source generator to turn it into C-sharp, if you have such a mind to, I guess. Um, but yeah, you, you could potentially have your own domain-specific language um, and write a D DSL parser that turns it into C-sharp, if you, if you really had such a large domain that it felt necessary for it. So to summarize, why are source code generators great compared with what's gone before? Because they are. I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the, the, main thing, the main thing for me is you're not tied to Visual Studio or you're not tied to external tools or internal tools. Um, you're not tied to it being breaking the Visual Studio changes. It's all about Roslyn. But the main thing is that because it's all done by the Roslyn compiler, you'll build, you'll build on, if you've got a build engine sitting on um, a CI CD pipeline, those will go and generate it as it compiles it on, on your CI pipeline as well. Um, I'd like that you don't have to write obscure templates. Navigating the C-sharp language itself can be a bit hairy, but I, there's a lot of benefit to it. And it, it sort of makes you start to understand when you're writing C-sharp, what it's actually generating into when it gets down to the nitty gritty. Um, and lastly, with the improvements made to Visual Studio 2019 22 to support source code generators, you can actually see the source code that it generates and get IntelliSense at, on that generated code. Like some source code generators, there are some limitations, and I've sort of touched on them in that you have to write it as .NET Standard 2.0. The main thing is a real big no-no, do not do this, is make calls to a database or HTTP calls. Because do you really want that happening every time you press a key on your keyboard in Visual Studio? You don't want to be doing that, no. Um, there, there are some things where, if, if, if you really need, need to, to do something like that, have, have some tool that's going to go and pull it down into a JSON file that comes into your, your project. So, so have some external step that's going to take that external thing, like, I don't know, get in a Swagger file, go go and pull the Swagger, the Swagger JSON or Swagger YAML file down, and then source code generate from it. Don't do it on the fly, live on a on an I.O. Um, at the moment, it can only generate C-sharp or VB. There's no F-sharp support, and there is an open issue on GitHub for Roslyn to say, and this is something that I would really love it to be able to do is say, I wanted to generate a JSON file, a text file, a CSV file, but that's not there at the moment. Debugging. I need a big sip of water for this one. <laughs> Any questions before I jump into debugging? I think we had uh, one question. Let's see. Uh, so it's about, about the Sharp Lab. Is it uh, yeah, it, running it, 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 the, the, the parsing? The and, yeah. and is it running the parsing? Oh, awesome. Yeah, so so I I, I I suspect it's actually going back and doing something back back on a server. Um, but but yeah, it, it and it's really, really quick. So you, you paste some code in and say, show me the IL, show me the syntax tree, and it's really, really quick, really impressive stuff on that. Nice. So I really like Sharp, Sharp Lab. <coughs> any, any others? I think no? oh, I think we are all caught up. Okay, cool. We're ready for the debugging. Right, <laughs> debugging. So when de 
when source code generators were first introduced, debugging was absolutely horrendous. The main reason for this is uh, when Visual Stu when you compile a source code generator inside Visual Studio, it, Visual Studio will take the compiled DLL and cache it. So whilst you can go in and sort of single step through it, I'm fine. If you then have to go make a code change because it's cached it, you have to restart Visual Studio again for it to then go and recompile it and then go and load it again. So that 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 sort of developer loop became really painful. Um, so what I I tended to do was I'd have it sitting in Visual Studio. In fact, I think I've got a slide here. And what I do is I go and create a custom build profile. So I called it something like sort of debug generator. And then what I do is I'd have an if debugger is attached, go and launch the debugger. What I then do is I trigger the build from .NET build outside on the CLI. And that way Visual Studio is not caching it. it it's just acting there as a, as a PDB inspector for, for your source code. So by launching the debugger, that, that then kicked in. But that is still a really painful process. What's better to do? Unit tests. Yay, unit tests. <laughs> <laughs> now, what you can do is you can write effectively, use the compiler as a service of Roslyn to go and to write some C-sharp code and stick it in a sort of resource file or actually put put text inside your, your unit test and then go and get it to actually do the comp compilation pass it your generator, and then your, you can step into your source code generator. What it then means is that you've got full access to the, the syntax tree. You can single step through it all. But what you can then do is take the output from your source code generator that comes back from the compiler, and you can then compa compare it to something that you're expecting. Now, is any, are you familiar with the um, Verify tool for snapshot testing? No? Okay, Not so it's this thing called, called um, Ver Verify for doing snapshots, where you can take snap snapshots of expected results and then compare results of your unit test to, to that snapshot. And it's got built-in support for doing source code generators as well. Um, I think Andrew Locke has got a blog post on it as well. Um, so your unit test, you, you don't have this horrible thing of having to sort of go and use Visual Studio or .NET Build to invoke the compiler to actually test your stuff. You can just unit test it as you would any other code. So I've got some link links here. There's a, a, a sort of, I don't know who Amy, Amy's 92 is, but they maintain a library, a list of sort of common source code generators. Now they make no, they haven't verified them all. They make no sort of um, guarantees about the quality of these things, but that's a good place to go and start looking at them. There's the source code generator cookbook on, on the Roslyn GitHub repo, and that sort of takes you step by step through writing um, source code generators. But .NET 5's gone, we're now into .NET 6, and Microsoft, like they always do, has started dog fooding and making use of their own code. So the first place the, the sort of was announced was the Razor compiler. So by default, this is turned on, and it gets a bit of a performance boost. Now, this graph was from the, the previews. I haven't seen a graph for the, the um, release, the actual release of .NET 6. As you can see, you, the, the performance of the Razor pages, both in sort of MVC and Blazor, is significantly faster. For logging, you can now write a partial method with an attribute, and the generator will write a load of the boilerplate code for you. So the, all you can do is you write a par partial, I think it's a partial method, yeah, partial method, and put this logger message, and decorate it. So I've got an example example there. So you've got logger message, event ID, level, and message, and you've got a method there, and it will go and generate all the boilerplate for writing to, you, to I logger for you. The big one, though, that got a lot of people talking was the system text JSON serializer. Now, as I alluded to right back at the start with things like Newtonsoft JSON and the original version of the system text JSON serializer, this was all using reflection un underneath and doing it all at, all at runtime. In .NET 6, they grass Microsoft has grasped the nettle and actually used source code generators. Now, I think, I, have I got my next slide? Yeah, so 
there's three modes. You can use the existing reflection based model, or you can tell it just to generate the serialization logic, or you can just get it to generate the models that stuff will get um, deserialized into. Now, there are, are some pro problems. Now, why wouldn't you do both? There's some problems with the deserialization if you're, you're doing async, sorry, with serialization if you're doing it in an async method. Um, so you can't use gen, gen, code generated serialization when you're inside an async, but you might still want to pre generate the data access model that you'd deserialize into. Now, one of the problems with the .NET 5 version of source code generation, and I alluded to it just now, is that every time you do a keystroke, it triggers the Roslyn compiler, and therefore it triggers your source code generation. And the one in .NET 5, it was doing the full source code pro generation process every time you, so if you've got a massive pro project, and this is what Microsoft found with parts of the base class library, the source code generators became really slow and dragged down your whole build process. So in .NET 6, there's a new version of source code generators that's much better. So we had iSource generator. Now we've got iIncremental generator. Now there's only the initial, you do everything inside the initialize method and you don't have an execute method. But I, I like to think of it a bit like middleware in ASP.NET, where you build up a pipeline and say, this is coming in, am I interested in it? Okay. I'm interested in this bit of code, therefore I'll go and trigger my source code generation. If the code hasn't changed because it's already cached it, then it won't trigger the, the generator, won't bother going through the generation process again because it says, hey, the source hasn't changed, so I'm not going to regenerate. There's some really good good information out there, and, and I'm running sort of tight on time now, so I, I can't go into it. But go and have a look at this website, the incremental generators on the Ro Roslyn. GitHub repo that gives you a really good walkthrough of it. What's coming up in .NET 7? There's not a lot been leaked about .NET 7 yet, apart from our friend regular expressions. <laughs> so I was saying earlier that it was doing some really nasty stuff with reflection emit and IL code and generating stuff on the fly and what have you. So now in .NET 7, regular expressions are source code generated. I was going to so, show some code here, but because .NET 7 is not out for a few months, I don't want to put it up here and then it will be different when it comes out in November. So the, the blog there from Stephen Taub or two, um, really interesting read about, and they've introduced some new, new stuff about backtracking in regular expressions and so on. If you do use regexes, go, that, that's something really cool coming in .NET 7. But source code generally, <laughs> with great power comes great responsibility. Do you really trust those externally written generators? Given that source code generators have access to your source code, do you trust it not to be logging in its code analysis results away and hiding away for collection later? That leads to the second point. Do you have source code for the generator to do that check? Lastly, are you reviewing the code that's being generated as part of a pull request before it gets merged into the main CI pipeline? This because there was the solar winds attack um, last last year, year before, whenever it was, and that that was an attack on the CI/CD pipeline. Source generators are a potential another potential attack vector as well. So there is some nice tooling inside Visual Studio that if you've got a source code generator, if you go to the dependencies and analyzers node, you'll see the source code generator, and you can see the the file that gets generated. There's also some options where by default, the source code doesn't actually land on the file system, but you can say, I want the, the file actually output, so you can capture it inside your source code uh, repository as well on Git. So if that starts to change, as part of a pull request, you can start to go, oh, why, why is this changing? So the due diligence process, if it's open source, you can check the source code, but can you be assured that the source, the NuGet package definitely came from that repository? And I think there's some new stuff that Claire Novotny talked about at NDC London about the stuff inside NuGet to sort of verify the source of it. Um, if it's a commercial package, well, you won't necessarily have access to the source code. So you're down to trusting the vendor and things like digital signing to make sure it hasn't been tampered with. And if it's been written in-house, 
I hope you've got a good pull request pull request flow um, to make sure that you can check what's going on. So I'm r running out, out of, out of um, voice now, but in what about an hour and 10 minutes, we've covered 33 years of source code generation, but there's still more. Where's source code generation going? Now, I've, I've got teenage boys, and over the past few years, they've been at school using things like Scratch and the BBC Microbit um, on the uh, Microsoft uh, Make Code portal. I had an idea about this a few years ago for something I was working in a business application, and they then found out the um, MIT were way ahead of the game on this. But this, this is sort of almost back, back to the old days of sort of like VB3, of drag and drop designing code. But what I like about this is certainly on the Microbit website, you can drag and drop all these things and put them together like a jigsaw puzzle. And then you see the actual source code that gets generated. And then GitHub's Copilot and IntelliCode in Visual Studio. I've just recently started a new con contract where I've been given an enterprise license of Visual Studio and IntelliCode scares me. Because <laughs> I am starting to type and it, it, it's getting my code ahead of me. I have, haven't tried out um, Copilot yet, but it, fr friends who have been using it, it, find it really scary how, how it's getting ahead. But something struck me with Copilot. Copilot is only as good as the source code in a load of GitHub repos that it's analyzed for its AI model. Like with all AI models, is there a bias? So if there's a bad um, pro programming practice out there in the wild and enough people in GitHub are using that bad practice, so for example, opening SQL connections and not disposing of them, is Copilot going to start injecting that into your code? So I'm still a bit wary about, I, I think it's still early enough that whatever code that, get, that Copilot generates, I wouldn't just rely on it. I'd be scrutinizing it really hard. But- You should definitely try and check it out and see if it makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 but you had a very specific <laughs> yeah. case the so where it I, actually helped. I was working on my Spectrum emulator. That, mm -hmm. This was just two days ago or something like that. And depending on, so it, I'm, I'm not going to go in, into to really technical details, but when you're reading these tape files, you're, you're basically sending uh, pulses of ones and zeros to the um, ear bit yeah. uh, on the Spectrum. And a now I don't remember the the actual values, but a zero bit has a pulse which has a, a specific amount of T states. Yeah, that it, it takes a specific amount of T states, and the same thing with a one. So there, a one is going to be two pulses with seven hundred seventy five T states or something like that. And I'm like, I'm starting to write a bit. And it just continues, and so if the bit is true, then emit this, and it had the oh T states God. correct. Yeah, the number of <laughs> T states. It's like impossible. Oh my God. And, and, and the amount of T states were nowhere to be found in my code. No. I had to look them up. Oh, wow. Is this, is this really correct? And it was, it was correct. Oh and even worse, the implementation that Copilot did for me was better than the one that, that I had in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is scary, isn't it? Really scary. It, it is. is. It is. But, um, I, but, I mean, it, it is cool, but it's also dangerous yeah. well, at the I'm same time. Well, I'm about to scare you a bit more now. <laughs> Underneath Copilot is OpenAI Codex. And on their website, they've now got a demo of turning natural language into JavaScript. So, oh, so really? this is where I start to get scared for my job because I'll, I'll leave this running <laughs> for, for a little bit. And I've got the link there if, if anyone wants to go off and have, have a look at it because it, it, it goes on for about 10 minutes. So I won't, I won't leave this. I've, I've sped this up and I'll just leave it for, for a little bit. It, it's the next sort of couple Small of Small-ish. Yeah. <laughs> and, and this is where I really start to find it scary. That is pretty cool. Maybe I should go into a JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> Im 
imagine this, but with CSS. Oh my God. <laughs> you, I, I don't think you can tell any AI in the world, make it good, and it will come out accessible, yeah, but, but good. Make it center. <laughs> you have... would just say, make it look better. Imagine that. Make it look better. <laughs> But what scares me is you've got things like Specflow at the moment, so BDD, where you can say sort of um, when this, or I'm expecting that. Taking that to the next stage and getting this, before long, we'll have BD, sort of business analysts writing this sort of stuff and writing our code. Scary stuff. But anyway, that, that, that's, that's enough of that demo. This is the one that's super, super, super scary. <laughs> so NVIDIA train, got an AI model to watch 50,000 games of Pac-Man, no game engine, and it was able to recreate Pac-Man. Yeah. That I find really, really scary. Based on what? Based Just watching games. games of Pac-Man. So, so using computer vision to, to watch games of Pac-Man. It, it got to watch 50,000 Pac-Man I don't plays. like it. No. That's... So, uh... That's scary. So, so the, the, the link to the blog is, is at the bottom there, but that is super, super scary. Yeah. So. So let's not talk it, about AI anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so let's leave AI to one side. In summary, what goes in comes out. So we're interested in metadata, which is sort of API structures, things like sort of WSDL, Swagger, gRPC, database structures. So information scheme from the database text files, syntax and semantic trees in C-sharp, anything you can analyze and get meaning from, even raw memory on a ZX Spectrum, that's your source for your source code generator. Coming out, like I had in my boxes earlier, you need to understand the target language statements, how they're constructed. Because you're sort of writing your C-sharp code inside strings effectively, you haven't got any IntelliSense to tell you, unless you go and write, write it over in sort of, um, uh, try.net or, or um, link pad or something and then bring it in and then turn it into strings. Unit tests are the way forward because real-time debugging is hard. You only have to resort to real-time debugging when something just doesn't make sense. And that wraps it up from me. So th thank you for having me, Jessica and Jimmy. Um, I, I hope, hope it's been slightly interesting, even if it was just a walk down memory lane. Um, so much fun. There, there, there's all the ways to get a hold of me. Um, I've done some talk, talks before about configuration and the, the horrors of going from sort of um, apps, app config out and the new wonderful world of app settings in .NET Core. And um, I've done sort of webinars about dependency injection as well. So there's links there. If you search on YouTube for Steve Talks Code, you'll probably find me wittering on inanely about something or other. Um, and the QR code there is to the GitHub gist of uh, the various links. And that's me. Nice. Look at that. It's been awesome. Oh, thank you, it Eric. It has been scary, funny, interesting, all of it. I mean, the session started with a set spectrum. It, it, <laughs> it, 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 it oh, you guys thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Starting on a high note, oh, you <laughs> ending mean, on one as well. You mean like you do with uh, movies? If it has the lightsaber, it gets two extra points. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds reasonable. Great talk. Thanks. Oh, thanks for that, Teddy Bear. I'd, I'd applaud <laughs> if you could hear me. Oh, no, thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it's uh, still, still super interesting and still fun. I think so, so how have persuaded anyone those, to actually yeah. start using source code generators? That's the $64,000 question. <laughs> 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 I am. Uh, I'm definitely going to. Uh, I'm. I'm actually uh, one of the chapters uh, of the book I'm writing is going to be on source generators. So this was Ooh, perfect. Excellent. Do I know anything? No, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it makes sense because uh, that's, so it, it it's kind of like like you know um, you're you're submitting a talk that you haven't written yet. Yeah. So you have to to write it and you have to learn it. Kind yeah. of the same thing, and it makes sense because uh, my book is on Blazor, so source code generators is kind of a, awesome a big part of it. Yeah. Um, have, have you seen um, yeah. the stuff Andrew Locke's done on source code generation in Blazor? Uh, I'm not sure. 
Have, have, have a look at Andrew Drew Locke's um, blog site because he's done some stuff about source code generation in Blazor as well. Awesome. Will do, will do. Need to look that up. And, and we actually have one who's uh, catching it on video on demand. So we need to put that up. Well, it's on um, Twitch for two weeks and then it's on uh, YouTube as soon as we put it up there. Awesome um, stuff. Because sometimes you need to watch it one more time to actually mm. uh, pay attention <laughs> I'll, I'll, or, I'll, or actually understand things. I'll yeah. have to hide behind the sofa. I'll have to hide behind the sofa and watch, watch, watch sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no! Why did I say that? Oh no! I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> Just want to see the spectrum stuff again. Yes. <laughs> we play that on repeat. We yeah. gotta go to the hours because we have a lot of stuff since we moved in storage still. So all the Spectrum magazines are in storage. So we need yeah. to go and get them. Uh, yeah, I, I think we I'm we really need to do that myself. this summer. Yeah, I'm crossing myself in that I got rid of my magazines. I, I kept kept the Spectrum and I kept kept the magazine, uh, kept the books. And I kept the loaded cassette, the cassettes. But unfortunately, where I've got the replacement keyboard, half the keys have stopped working. I, <laughs> I did manage to get it boot, and it's got sort of the interface one and micro drives, but. Unfortunately, one of the keys that doesn't work is enter. And without that, oh, no. oh. <laughs> it, it's not going to do much. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I look forward to having having to play with your Blazor emulator, J Jimmy, with uh, the tap file support. Because I've been using Please Fuse so, so far. Oh, right, right. So my, my emulator is, is not going to be 100% uh, when, it, when it comes to timing and all of that. But uh, it, it's yeah. fun. But uh, I, I, love, I love the so Minute Miner demo on it. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much yeah. for joining us. Thank, thank, thank you for having us. Super, super fun. Yeah. And next Thursday, yeah. we're not going to stream. No, and that's my fault. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be in uh, Malmo visiting my mom or driving up. I, I'm not sure mm. which day I'm driving back. But. Maybe in the week off the last. Yes, let's do it. And take care, everyone. It's been fun. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Let's, uh, let's switch over. And, uh, press the button. Press the button. Press the button. <laughs> take care. <laughs>